So kia ora everyone. Um, for those of you joining us for the first time, welcome to Hell Pizza's Great New Zealand Book Trip live reading. Um, and um, welcome back to all of you who've just joined us, um, who've joined us before. Um, so I'm Siang, the marketing manager at Hell Pizza. Um, um, oh, and I'm, I'm here to introduce our wonderful author for today. And I'll come back to you a little bit later to host some Q&As and announce two winners of our giveaways, which is, of course, today's book, Moped 2, The Queen's Poem. Now, before I begin, I just wanted to say how awesome it is to see so many of you here today. All of us at Help Pizza love that we're able to help you, our tamariki, um, develop a passion for reading um, through Hell, the Hell Reading Challenge and the now the Great New Zealand Book Trip. There's so many unique and talented authors writing about our beautiful country and with the Great New Zealand Book Trip, we hope that you'll come along with us and discover some of the amazing places right here in Aotearoa. And so it's time to welcome our author who will be taking us on today's trip, um, the talented Dr. Selena Tusitala Marsh. She's an Auckland-based Pacific poet and scholar of Samoan, Tuvaluan, English, Scottish, and French descent. She was the first person of Pacific descent to graduate from uh, gra graduate with a PhD in English from the University of Auckland, where she now lectures in creative writing and Māori and Pacific literary studies. In 2012, she was chosen among 6,000 nominations um, to represent Tuvalu in Poetry Olympics that took place around the UK during the London Olympics. And now she was honoured with, she was also honoured with the title of Commonwealth Poet in 2016. So um, I'll now hand over to Dr. Marsh and we, we hope that you enjoy the reading and I'll see you again a little bit later. Kia ora koutou, talofalava, bulavanaka, malo elele, kia ora na whakalofalahi atu, namaste, Warm Pacifica greetings to you all. I'm so excited to be here. And I just saw in the chat a hello from Avondale Primary. Whoop, whoop. So um, I was born and raised in Avondale and I went to Avondale Primary, Avondale Intermediate, and eventually became head girl at Avondale College. So um, I have family who still live in Avondale and recently, I work with some graffiti artists and we put a big Avondale spider poem on the Avondale Community Centre. So um, really great to see all the highs from all the schools coming in. Oh, I love that. Oh, it's going to distract me. <laughs> um, I just, I love being here with all you, um, all you kids. Um, look out for the third Mophead book called Mophead Not Book Three, where I wake up with a huge knot in my hair. And um, in that book, I take 14 knotty questions that you guys have sent me over the last two years. And um, I prescribe as Dr. Mophead creative writing exercises for you to do. And like my other books, it's a book for kids of all ages. So I'm really pleased to be able to read from you uh, to you from my second book. So first book is Mophead. So this has just been taken me talking about journeys through Aotearoa, New Zealand. This has taken me all over the place um, with lots of people wanting me to come and read from the book everywhere. And even a nana in Kaikohi, like knitted me a mop head doll. And she was saying um, her grandchildren loved mop heads so much, they demanded that she knit them each a mop head doll. And she sent me pictures and I said, I will send you two books if you knit me a mop head doll. So now I have this gorgeous girl, she's, she's got a little tapa um, handbag with Samoa on it. She's got her flower in her hair. She's got my gray streak there. And she's even got like really cute pink undies. See? Yeah. Oh, and she's got jandals, knitted jandals. Is that, is that cute or what? So, <laughs> and a beautiful hibiscus flower. And you've got to watch out for the flowers because um, they're in my next book. So let me read to you not from Mop Hood 
Mophead book one, but from Mophead book two, and I know a lot of you have read it, and I just get so excited reading it um, live. So here we go. I'm going to share my screen. Oh, look at all the highs still coming in. Love it. And here we go. Mophead, the Queen's poem, Mophead two. And there's Minnie Mophead in the background. She always pops up. She's that cheekier, more curious, more braver part of me. And um, good news is, is that we all have a Minnie Mophead inside us. Creative writing helps me bring her out. Mophead to the Queen's poem, to, to stand with integrity. Integrity, that's when your insides match your outsides. She drew me again. And there's Minnie Mophead drawing herself. It's very self-reflexive. Like, there's lots of mirror, uh, mirrors and mirrors in this book. One day, I received a letter from the Queen of England. I wonder if it's because we share the same birthday, 21st of April. And I'm just going to pause there. And whenever I've gone and read in schools, there's like at least one other person that shares my birthday and the Queen's birthday. So I'm wondering if you pop in the chat if anyone in your classroom shares the Queen's birthday like me. That would be interesting for me to know. I'd been crowned the Commonwealth poet. Your service to the Queen. Write her a poem. What's the Commonwealth? The Commonwealth is made up of countries the Queen used to rule. They were called colonies. India, Navigator Isles, bzz, New Hebrides, Ghana, Gilbert, bzz, Alice Isles, Australia, New Zealand. The Queen's hive was strong and powerful. She got to make all the rules for her colonies. Where's my royal jelly? She could name them. London, England. And oh, there's a London in the island of Kiribati in the Pacific Islands. She could claim them. Captain Cook, discoverer of the Pacific. Who's that dude pointing at the stars? That's Tupaya, Cook's Navigator, but school doesn't teach that story. Shame them. Well, that's not right. God, gods, and tame them. We bring order and peace and boxes to take and sell your stuff in. Phosphate, which is a mineral, sugar, coconuts, spice, Guano, that's bird poop. But no one likes to be bullied. That's called colonialism. So the colony started breaking the Queen's rules and making their own. Talofa, I'm Tusi Tala, Mophead's granddad. This is Piglet, my Piglet. The Gilberts becomes Kiribati. The Alice Islands becomes Tuvalu. Ending colonial rule wasn't easy. People died. Many are still struggling. So when I got my crown, not all of my friends were happy about it. Sell out. That's when your insides don't match your outsides. Can I stand up for my people who struggled against the queen and still serve the queen? I got out my journal. Where do I stand? 
the answers were inside me. Tu si tala. I'm in the middle. I've always stood in the middle. My older brother Luca, my younger sister Sam. I grew up being caught in the middle, stuck in the middle, and felt like I had to choose sides. But I wouldn't choose one side, not at home. I want to be with you both. Not at school. Sporty, arty, brainy, acting. Are you one of us? Yes. Not on the street. Are you Samoan? Are you English? Are you French? Are you Tuvaluan? Are you Scottish? Yes. Afakasi. And not at university. Are you a Pacific Island poet? Or a Pacific Island scholar? Yes. I am a Pacifica poet scholar. But why do I stand in the middle? Tusi tala, ala equals bridge. Again, the answers were inside me. I bridge, not block. Oh, beep, beep, you can't pass. So I ignored the sting. Geez, can't you take a joke? Talk to the hand, bro. Hello, is this the palace? Yes, this is Barnaby, the Queen's helper. Kia ora, it's Mophead, the Commonwealth poet. Beautiful. Now, about the poem, you will perform it for the Queen in London. In England? It's the only London I know. Actually, there's one in the Pacific. Every year, the Queen hosts Commonwealth Day at Westminster Abbey. All former colonies are invited. Why? Well, it marks our alliances. That's when you make up the rules together. And, well, it marks our allegiances. That's when you stick together because of the rules. And, hmm, um, our colonial histories. Our land, the Queen's. Ah! That reminds me, the Queen has a few rules. No kidding. Five, to be exact. Well, sure, poets like rules. We like to break them. Rule one. The Queen chooses the event theme every year. This year, it is unity. Great. That will be the title of your poem. For real? Is that a question? Um, not really. Rule two. 3,000 people are invited. 2,000 school children aged nine and upwards, prime ministers, heads of state, and of course, the royal family. Great. The poem will need to appeal to all of them. For real? Is that a question? Well, isn't the Duke of Edinburgh 94 years old? Yes, that's correct. So the poem has to be fun for nine-year-olds and 94-year-olds? Is that a question? Yes, so that's one way to look at it. Rule three, there are 53 Commonwealth countries. The poem must include all of them. Hmm, challenging. What about an acrostic poem? A poem where the first letter of each line spells something. Hmm.
and a rule four, an acrostic poem might be a fine idea in theory, but the BBC are filming live. So the poem must not be longer than three minutes. <gasps> Moppy madness. The rules were hard. Why am I doing this again? I needed to build a bridge from London's smoggy streets to the sinking sands in the South Seas. I aware piglet. Rule five. The fifth and final rule is that the poem must not be political. That's how a country decides stuff. Are floating piglets political? The poem will be checked by the palace to make sure all the rules are followed. Moppy mayhem. There was a lot to think about. I got out my favorite pen, my journals, my books. I had nine months to write the poem. June, research the Commonwealth, the Queen, Westminster Abbey, talk about it a lot, think a lot. July, write draft one, think some more. August, screw up draft one, write draft two, talk some more. September, throw away draft two, write drafts three, four, and five. October, dump drafts three, four, and five, look for draft one again. November, lose draft one, eat chocolate, lots. December, find draft one, begin draft six. January, get writer's block, panic, eat chocolate, more research on the Commonwealth, the Queen, the Abbey. February, clear space. March, go to London to visit the Queen. Each month passed, no poem. I pulled my hair out in frustration. Then one Sunday, I took a deep breath. <sighs> Everybody out of the house right now. I'm driving, do we have cake? Sweet, no drying the dishes. Those are my three sons. I walked around and around the poem, letting the title breathe. Then I stood in the middle of it and saw the other. There's a you and an I in unity. I wrote the whole poem in a week and sent it off to the palace. Only one word was changed. Alliances, allegiances, colonial uh, histories. Didn't need that word anyway. It looked like I had followed the rules. Rule one, title, unity, tick. Rule two, nine to 94 year olds, tick. Rule three, 50, 53 Commonwealth nations, tick. Rule four, less than three minutes, tick. Rule five, no politics, tick. But the palace doesn't know what poets know. That's my fine print. That a poem is a trickster. You can't control it. Maui, you tricked me out of my last fiery fingernail. But Granny, I wanted to know where fire came from. Oh, you're gonna know all right. That's Maui's grandmother, Mahuika. That a poem is a mirage. You can't believe what you see. What a fierce warrior he is. Oi, that's a she. It's Nafanua, goddess of war. A poem is curious and brave, taking you to unexpected places. Where are we going, Naimi Manoa? 
somewhere marvelous, Mophead. After the performance, the Queen admired the poem. How did you memorize that long poem? It's my job, Your Majesty, I'm a poet. Yes, I suppose it is, well done. The Duke forgot the poem. So, what do you do? Uh, I'm a poet, Your Royal Highness, I, I just performed back there. And two years later, Harry remembered the poem. Why, hello, it's the big head poet from the Abbey. And this time I've got my Toko Toko, my poet laureate walking stick. Wanna see? Harry took the Toko Toko and stomped it on the ground. You shall not pass. And he's thinking of Lord of the Rings, right? And Gandalf with his staff. He was only having fun, but his words hung around. You shall not pass. School, English only spoken. Go home coconuts, no native access, whites only. They reminded me of the queen and her rules. You shall pass, you shall not pass. but rules are made for breaking. Now the Queen's family look different. Sunny Bonani, Harry and Megan. South Africa, I greet you not only as part of the royal family, but as a woman of color. Our heroes look different. Hang on, Maui, wind is picking up. But Nani Mano, I'm hungry. Now, Fanua, you can chillax. I've read the stars. Stick to navigation, Tupaya. I will defend us. Our professors look different. Professor Konai Halu Thayman from Tonga. Professor Albert Wink from Samoa. Oh, there's my friend, Cake. Cake. Even our poets look different. Did you know there's a London in Kiribati? Where's Kiribati? It used to be the Gilbert and Ellis Islands, dear. Is that political? Granddad, do get with it. It's a post-colonial world. Professor Albert says the post part just do doesn't just mean after colonialism. It also means around, against, and alongside. Alongside? is where I stand. So here we are, just you and me, the queen from the palace, the poet from the sea, sharing our thoughts over a cup of tea. There's a you and an I in unity, cost the earth and yet it's free. Because where you stand matters. The end. Awesome. Thank you so much. That was that was absolutely beautiful. Um, and yeah, and 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 the the your the story is just really amazing. It um holds so many, so many important messages about our history, our present, and you know, our, I guess, well and how powerful our words can be moving forward. So thank you very much. Um, like all, from, all, from everyone at Howell and I'm sure from everyone at the schools as well. Um, cool. Um, now, um, did you want to talk a little bit about the um, your illustration process and how it was all inspired? And Absolutely, absolutely. So at the back of Mophead 2, I've got these end papers and that's basically my process as a writer like I keep notebooks and journals I write all the time I cut stuff out and I stick it in my 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 pages and then I draw around it I draw lots of words I've always been a doodler so this is the beginning of a notebook um, that is now online 
Um, my first poetry collection was called Fast Talking PI. So I've named this journal Fast Talking PI Goes to London to Visit the Queen. But like I just, I've always expressed myself through the line, through the written line and through the drawn line. And because the lines kind of carry my emotions. And um, I know, I don't know how many of you guys, you kids have things that you're particularly drawn to that you always find yourself drawing a lot. Like when I was at Avondale Primary, the best drawer in the class was Lorraine and she drew the most exquisite elephants. And I just like, I would try and try to do her elephants the same way as um, she could, but I, I never could, but no one could draw coconut trees better than me and in fact I've got a little coconut tree right there in that little, and I just love doing palm trees and coconut trees so it's like find the thing that gives you energy and practice and practice and practice until you get it to the best that like until you like it the most and now in my signature of Selena Tusitala Marsh the tea I draw as a little palm tree now so I've really integrated it into my way of being and I think you know one of the one of the takeouts in the next book and one of the things I often say when I go to schools is that mistakes are made for making and that you can't make anything if you're if you're scared of making a mistake and it's within the mistake that you get to stretch and grow and to create and so that's why I love doodling because you know, it's not like a brand new canvas that you have to get it right because it's really expensive and, you know, you don't want to waste money. Doodling belongs everywhere. And I used to doodle in school books as well quite a bit. So what my, my process for illustrating is um, I, I woke up with this story and I literally got one of my journals this isn't the original journal but I keep these journals and every morning I do three pages um, of writing and doodling and drawing and I like had poems um, thoughts like look that's what I did the other day looks of just in, like little feet and little flowers and just it's just a way of thinking through ideas and mop head two came out with one um, morning I woke up and I just quickly storyboarded the whole thing and what I mean by storyboarding is that I just divided this page up into all these little squares and I quickly jotted down and 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 did really rough stick figures of scenes in the book that I could see from beginning to end because I know where I wanted to start and I know where I wanted to end so it was like okay how do I get there and just tell my story because um, I know one of the questions that, that I was asked is, you know, is this a true story? And do, do I only write, you know, what kind of stories do I write? Um, and for me, like, our lives contain the best stories if we know how to look at them, if we know how to story around them. You know, I used to think that nothing, nothing exciting ever happens to me, but actually... <laughs> You know, everybody's life has um, has drama and action and desire and challenge and problems to overcome and ways that we can um, grow through them. So uh, to go back to the illustration story, sometime, sometimes I don't have the words to get from here to here, but I have the images, I have the pictures. So it works in you know, hand in hand with storytelling. So, so a little bit of visual, um, lots of writing. And then once I'd finished kind of storyboarding it on paper, I'd just gotten an iPad and um, and I didn't I didn't have the um, I didn't have paper with me or, or anything. And I just thought, why don't I just try like, you know, um, drawing on my iPad? Because it's so easy to start again. It's so easy to have lots and lots of um, different kinds of the same picture and both books were essentially drawn on a on an app on my ipad which i love because then i could color it in as well even though i'm not a colorist you know and i didn't even think i was a good drawer actually like i still have it like i i'm an illustrator now which is like 
I can't believe that, you know, it's so amazing. Hang on, I'll just, okay. oh, stick to my own. sorry about that. Um, so I just, um, I've just made another book. I've illustrated a, a friend's book with Princeton University Press, and I did 40 illustrations for that book. So I'm kind of getting more comfortable with calling myself an illustrator, but really it just starts off with kind of having fun with words and letting yourself uh, make mistakes and go a bit crazy on the page and then finding your own style. Like the way I draw elephants now is not the way that Lorraine drew, drew, ele you know, drew elephants. And <laughs> I don't know what Lorraine um, is up to at the minute, but everyone's got their own quirky, different style, yeah, of storytelling visually and orally and in written words. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, cool. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's really, really, really cool insight. Like, you know, um, hearing about how you your process, um, your doodles and communicating um, through through illustrations without when you can't find the words. And it really kind of shows how well you put it all together in, in, in Moped, the Moped series. Um, yeah, and it's it's a real, real awesome insight. Thank you. Well, if I could, like, one of my favorite books in the whole world is um, The Boy, the Mole, the Fox, and the Horse oh, yeah. by Charlie McKeezy. But look at this. This is, this is how he begins his book. And he's an artist artist, right? He, he's a painter. But the simple line and just the curve of that little boy's back and the little nose of the mole sticking, it's like, to me, that, like, that's a thousand words right there about the boy's um, loneliness, his desire to, to find out what his, where his place in the world is, and then this kind of unexpected bit of help that pops up. And so it's like, I wanted to also be able to tell a story just by kind of the stroke of a line, just by, you know, Mophead, the slump of Mophead's back or, you know, her explosiveness or, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think I think you've nailed it. <laughs> um, cool. All right. Well, um, we're running a little bit over time, but what we'll do is we'll run through some questions and answers. Um, we'll get through as many as we can. Um, and yeah, apologies in advance for we might not we might not be able to read everyone's um, questions out straight away. Um, so we've got a, a real a real good one to kick things off from Hayat uh, Hayata Community Campus um and their question was why do you write man it's just to tell to tell my story like to tala is the Samoan word for storyteller mm. so and the i wanted to tell my story because i hadn't read it and a lot of amazing writers simply write what they want to read and they see that there's a silence out there. And it's like, well, if I don't see myself, lots of people like me won't see themselves. Um, so really it was just to kind of speak out there into the, into the void. And it's amazing how many people do relate um, to the stories that I tell. That's why I write. Oh, that, and and that's, that's really awesome as well. Cause you know, um, you know, so many people, um, so many people like it, it helps so many people sort of relate and you know um, people might be going through certain things um and and just need need to need to know that they're not they're not the only ones you know going through those kind of things so ah great um next question is from hangangia um, peninsula school at what age did you start writing and have you got any um, advice um you'd give to aspiring writers yeah, so I think I wrote and published my first poem when I was about 10 or 11, and it was on nuclear, the nuclear testing that was happening in the Pacific. I was quite an earnest child, <laughs> um, but I remember seeing pictures on the news about this big mushroom cloud after the French had tested their nuclear weapons in these Pacific islands, and I thought, well, that's unfair. Why, why don't they test them over there in their country? Why do they have to come to the Pacific and, and do that and, um, and have people move out of their homes and have the waters be polluted? And, and so I wrote a poem about it and I, I submitted it to a local um, 
magazine, a local news, the local newspaper, and they published it. And then I remember walking in Avondale and a woman came up to me and she said, well, you're Selena, aren't you? And I went, yes. And she, she said, oh, I love that poem. And I, I was like, what? Like I'd, I'd submitted it a whole month before and I'd kind of forgotten about it. And it, and it suddenly occurred to me that, wow, the, the, the story that was in my head, the writing and the thoughts that was in my head, when I published it, it kind of belongs to the world now. And it helps because she, she really loved the poem. And I thought, this is, what magic is this? This is like incredible. And so, yeah, about the age of 10 or 11, I discovered the power of writing. And <clears throat> I guess the best tip that I can give um, to aspiring writers is to write, to write regularly, to make capturing your observations of the world a habit. Um, and it's really challenging in these days because our attention is so kind of split up um, into checking phone and social media and, and other people and doing lots that the reason why I, I, I don't even get out of bed, I grab my journal and I begin writing what I'm thinking um, and capturing um, dreams and um, just, just, just things that, that are kind of foremost in my mind and sometimes it'll be a little something I've seen on the street an image or it'll be an overheard conversation I've heard at the bus stop that'll be really interesting and I'm like oh I could write a poem simply about that little overheard conversation but it's all part of the process of making but if you don't cast your net out there you're not going to get any fish <laughs> and I have like journals lying everywhere all shapes and sizes little ones I stick in my bike bag um, big ones they've got to be foldable they've got to be transportable I always have two pens with me just in case I've recorded on my phone when I've been you know at different places um, without paper because that's what your job your, your job is to give yourself as much food to get inspiration from, you know, to, to eat from. So it's almost like, you know, going to the supermarket. Your job is to fill your trolley. Um, it's the universe's job to, to pick out the food and make this beautiful recipe. You've just got to be present and have your stuff there because inspiration works in weird and wonderful ways. Um, but if you don't, if you've got an empty kitty, there, it's really hard to just kind of make something up. And I, there was a question there about what if you don't know what to write about? I think it was one of the last questions. And it's like, there's always something to write about. If you can see, if you can hear, if you can smell, there's always something to write about. It's more that we, we, um, it's hard for us to focus. It's hard for us to kind of get quiet so we can, hear and see and smell what's around us and, and to begin writing. Um, but a really quick writer's tip is to just grab a book, any book, open it up, close the eyes, put your finger on a line, pull out that line and use it to begin a poem or a story and just write nonstop for like three minutes. And the reason you write nonstop for three minutes is so you don't kind of uh, censor yourself or stop yourself from continuing like because it's not perfect you just want to kind of do a brain dump around that inspiring line or those sets of words so there's always something to write about yeah I really like the idea of just brain dumping everything you know it might not make sense straight away but at least all your inspiration is captured right there and then and put onto paper that you can come back to it later right Absolutely. Well, and like at the, at the end of Mophead 2, I took the Commonwealth program and I did a blackout poem. So I blacked out most of the words and just had these words left to make the line. Um, we mess, draw and shape identity. We give it life, Liz. So that was short for Queen Elizabeth. And that was a poem written in response to the Queen's question, how on earth did you memorize that poem? Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can find, you can find creativity and, and poetry everywhere, according to me. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, this, yeah. oh, cool. All right. Um, so next one is um, from uh, a, 
uh, oh, sorry, hold on. Um, I've lost my piece. Oh, from Harper Grace Bright from Ashburton Intermediate School. Um, and Harper wanted to know, what is your favorite piece and why is it your favorite piece? Mm, you mean piece of writing? Um, she hasn't elaborated on that, but yeah, I reckon. Writing, I reckon. Piece of cake, if it's yep, a piece, piece of writing. Cake, it's double chocolate fudge, piece of writing. <laughs> I think I have, rather than, um, I, I think I have lines that have stayed with me for years and years because they're so inspirational. And one of those pieces of writing, or one of those lines is from um, something that Maya Angelou said. And she said um, in a piece of writing, a bird doesn't sing because it has the answer. A bird sings because it has a song. And I love that line so much. A bird doesn't sing because it has the answer. A bird sings because it has a song. Because so much of, you know, when I started writing, it was like, am I doing this right? Only to learn over the years that there is no right or wrong. There's just your way and refining and crafting and practicing your way, finding your voice, finding your way of seeing the world and telling your stories is the, is the way, is the right way for you. So um, yeah, that, that's one of the pieces of, that's one of the lines that have, has continued to inspire me over my life. And that's the beauty of memorizing lines too, because then you've got them always with you. And they come up at the most surprising times, often exactly when you need to hear them. Yeah, like you said earlier, you know, inspiration from everywhere. So, so you know, anything can spark some of those memories and some of those lines, right? So, awesome. Um, great question there. Thank you. Um, and we probably have time for one more. And I thought this one was a really good one. Um, um, this has come from Palmerston North Intermediate School. And they um, wanted to know your thoughts on why it's um, why reading is so important for the whole family. Mm, that is really good. <laughs> well, I've got three sons, and they none of them really read. So I'm kind of like I see how important it is. Like they've always had books all around them. Um, they just haven't been interested um, in reading as much as they've been interested in sports. But what's delicious is that now they're start, like the youngest one is starting to pick up books without me forcing him to, like out of his own choice. And that's a beautiful thing. And I, I think one of the reasons is that you as a family can enter into entire worlds outside of yourself, beyond yourself. You can enter into that imaginative space together. But, you know, for, I'm, just, I'm just keeping it real because my... <laughs> my boys are, will come to reading a lot later than um, uh, other 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 kids, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can I can relate. My um, I've got two kids. Um, my first my first daughter, my daughter Florence, she loved reading right from the very beginning. You know, like as soon as she could flip a page, we sat down with her read books and stuff. And then our second um, came along, Bruno, and he he for probably the first the first year and a half two years he just didn't wasn't into reading and then all of a sudden he just want want to want to sit on the lap and all he wanted to do is sit on our lap and have us read to him so you know oh, it's, it's, it is one of those things you know if you push too much it seems like if you push too much um yes. reading is a passion and i love that something that people develop yes. over time yeah yeah the good thing about books is that they're around forever yeah. <laughs> so you know yeah Okay, um, all right. I think that's that's all we have time for in terms of the questions. Oh. And answers. I'm sorry for those who didn't get their um, questions read out. Um, but yes, so I am going to announce the two winners of our um, giveaway box today. Um, the first is Mercury Bay Area School. Yay! And the second, Ridgeway, um, Ridgeway School Year Two, oh, Year Three and Four. Um, cool. All right. Well, um, this is, um, we're coming to an end now. So 
Um, I want to take the, the time to say thank you very much, Selena. Um, your, you know, um, your reading, your 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 thoughts on on your creative process and your thoughts on 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 the power of words have been really insightful and really amazing to hear and encouraging as well. So thank you, thank you very much. Most welcome. Thank you, everybody, and happy reading.